Welcome to Southgate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you are joining in with us today, that you are connected with a local church. Uh, we hope and we pray that if you're in the North Grenville area, that you are connected to Southgate in a physical way, that you are coming out to services and you are joining in on the events that are happening in person. And if you're wondering how you can get connected to some of those things, uh, we would just say that you could sign up for the email uh, that uh, goes out weekly as well. You can follow us on our socials and uh, check in on the website to see what is going on in person and in our community. And so uh, we want you to be connected in that way. And uh, if you want to participate in what we are doing by giving financially, that will be up on the screen. We hope and we pray that this service is a benefit to you and your walk with Jesus. So a short time ago when I was in Egypt, we were able to go to museums, we were able to go to the pyramids, I was able to climb inside a pyramid, I was able to go to the Valley of the Kings and check out some of the tombs, and uh, what was amazing is to see and understand the embalming process. So, so mummies, and seeing these mummies in various capacities, various forms, and uh, what was consistent in our time there is that whenever you saw a mummy, you were not allowed to take a a picture. So I don't have any pictures of the mummies that we saw, but we did see a lot of them in different museums that we went to. And uh, it would be similar to a picture like this, very darkened room, and you would have mummies, uh, all, all different ones, men and women. And uh, what was really interesting is that they would have, um, they would do like uh, CAT scans on these mummies, and they would explain to you how they died, and certain ones had maybe broken bones, or they had been uh, impaled, and, and so you can find out a little bit of the history of each person. And it was amazing to see the preservation of their bodies. I mean, the hair and the skin and the teeth and, and all this stuff. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible to think about. Now, this is not just an Egyptian thing, although they were very good at preserving the body. We see this all over the globe in different capacities where they're, where they're trying to preserve mainly the skin and the bones of these mummies for preparation for what they believe to be the afterlife. It was part of their culture. Their culture revolved around different gods, like we've mentioned. That's what the plagues were based on. And so they had these things, and they wouldn't just, they wouldn't just like leave the corpse out. They would take the corpse, they would remove the vital organs, organs except for the heart, and they would uh, put them in salt, and then they would uh, put them in little jars or containers to take all of the water or the liquid out of them. Then they would wrap the body in different oils, like essential oils and myrrh and different spices. And then they would wrap the body again in uh, layers of like cloth or strips of linen. And they would preserve, just Egypt's climate would preserve these things for a very long time. Now, one of the places that we stayed was Heliopolis. And Heliopolis would have been very familiar to Joseph. Joseph's wife, she was from Heliopolis. Her dad was a priest in that area. And uh, some of the, uh, the things that we saw there, some of the very ancient structures, Joseph would have actually seen these very same things. And so it's incredible to think about. But, but Joseph, a lot of us don't understand this, but he would have actually been embalmed himself. 
I mean, he had climbed the ranks, Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers. And this is how Israel really gets into Egypt in the first place, right? They follow the steps of Joseph into uh, Egypt. And then when he dies, it's recorded here in Genesis 50, 24. It says, then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Joseph is reflecting on this game plan that is down the road of this land, this promised land that God has provided the Israelites. Verse 25, it says this, And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And so I want you to imagine Joseph is a mummy, okay? Uh, he's saying my bones. He's talking about he's, he's mummified. And so he, he's saying this, please swear an oath that you will take my bones when it is time and bring them to the promised land. And so then we pick up the story here a little bit further in Exodus 13, 19. So that first verse, uh, verse those first group of verses were found in Genesis 50. The next group is, is Exodus 13, 19. It says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. And so you can imagine this mummy, right? Yeah. Moses gets word from Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, fine, I will let your people go. Just get out of here. My son died. All these plagues have happened. Just get out of here and please leave. But before Moses does leave, he grabs the mummy. He grabs Joseph. He grabs these bones. I don't know how they're carrying it. He's not kind of throwing it on his shoulder, but he, he heads out and he grabs his mummy before they leave to, to, to kind of this oath that they've taken to Joseph because Joseph is the one who brought the Israelites in. Now they're heading out of Egypt and, and later on, I mean, further down the road into the promised land, we see this, Joshua 24, 34, or 32. It reads like this. And Joseph's bones, so the mummy, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor or the father of Shechem. These became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And so we see full circle here, the, the, this, this storyline, this plan of, of Joseph and, and coming into Egypt and now being realized way down the road as they enter the promised land, this mummy finally gets laid to rest. Joseph gets laid to rest in the promised land. They, they cart his body, his remains all around, including to the story we're going to talk about here today. And so today we're going to close out our series on the wilderness. And there's one story that we should have covered in here, but we didn't. I wanted to leave it to the end because I didn't know exactly where I was going to go with it. And so we are going to deal with it here today. And this is the story of coming out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. So we're going to be looking at the Red Sea, this idea of what was about to come and God had provided for them up to this point. He has, he has rescued them out of the slavery that they were in. He's done this for them and he leads, he's about to, they're about to go into the wilderness and um, we see the parting of the Red Sea. And so Pharaoh finally says, okay, go, I am sick of this, I can't handle this anymore. And we know, we found out that Pharaoh admitting this was almost an admission of him not being a God, right? Because he was considered a God and God was, was just our, our, the one true God was disarming, dismantling all the Egyptian gods, including Pharaoh. Now the Israelites, they celebrate the first Passover, right? As, as God has instructed them to do with the blood on the door, I mean, all, all these kind of things to save their firstborns. And then, then they set out into the wilderness and Pharaoh chases, changes his mind Instead of letting them go, he gets 600 chariots, he gets all of his army, and they go 
pursuing the Israelites to chase them down, to hunt them down, and to seek vengeance, if you will, of what has happened. And God has saved the Israelites miraculously in this story of the parting of the Red Sea. Now, when we were in Egypt, it's fascinating because Egyptians just see this as matter of fact, that this actually took place. In fact, they have found chariots and chariot wheels and weapons at the bottom of the Red Sea to solidify this story in history. And this is an amazing thing as the Israelites are, 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 are just stuck here. They've, they've come out of the capital. Now they've headed out to the Red Sea. They're at the banks of the Red Sea. There's nowhere left to go. The, behind them are, are hills and mountains and they are penned in with this looming army. You can imagine two million Israelites just kind of stuck here. They don't know, they have nowhere to go. It's almost like God has led them into a trap and they don't know what to do. Now, a few facts about this story. We, we, we might have heard this story. You might have watched the Disney film on this story. But a few facts that we really need to kind of set our brains into understanding or painting the picture of this thing is this. Israel did not cross the Red Sea during the day. This happened at nighttime. And so a lot of pictures that you see or your kids' Bibles or whatever, it shows a picture of daytime, but the Bible clearly says this happened at night. This was a nighttime experience, e even more. I mean, this would have been kind of terrifying to see, right? I mean, it's, it's dark. It might be a moonlight. It could be cloudy that day. We don't know, but it is a dark time. It says that the wind blew all night long. So it wasn't just like the sea just like whoosh, immediately parted. This was a blowing of a wind that continued all night long that separates the waters and dries out the land that they could walk forward and through. And so we need to understand that this is happening at night. The wind, it's a, a strong wind that is blowing, that is parting the seas. The, the, the pillar of cloud here protected Israel. So it stood in the way of Israel, between Israel and the Egyptians. And so there's this huge pillar. They can't really see the other side. You can imagine it. There's strong winds blowing. It is dark. And so you have the Egyptians over here. You have the Israelites. They're passing through the sea on dry land as the waters part. And then, and then another thing we kind of need to realize here is that the Egyptians, they, they're not only pursuing the Israelites, but towards the end of the Egyptian army right here, they are actually fleeing. And so they, are, they, have, they have probably turned around. They're trying to get out of here. This is not like a quick pass through the Red Sea. This would have taken some time to get to the other side. And they are trying to run away from the way. They, they were heading one direction. And then they want to get out of there because they know what is coming. And, and, and so if you picture all that in your mind's eye, we set this story up here for, for where we're going here today. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 8 to start. It says, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. That's a lot of ites. And so this idea that there is something ahead, there, there is something more here. This is a, a, a kind of progression from one chapter of Israelites' history to the next. And they, and they walk through the parting of the Red Sea and a new chapter unfolds. But this is the destination. It always has been the destination in the journey. Joseph knew that. He, he foretold it. He asked for an oath that take my bones to bury me there. And so there's this idea that this is going to take place. Now, when Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt and he's heading to, the, to Canaan, he, this is where he's going. He could, have, he could have taken a very fast route. I mean, a route that would have literally only took maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe a little more than a week by foot. They could have got there. In fact, I got a map here. And you can kind of see, I talked about Heliopolis. I know it's very small. You can probably not even see it. But you have the, 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 um, the, the pyramids here. And they would have had, they, you know, they were up here. And they, they crossed the Red Sea. And uh, this is where they're heading. So, so they, they're up here. And they're supposed to go there. I mean, that is... That is where they were going. That's where God promised. That, this is the promised land, okay? And instead, instead of doing that, they kind of go, 
wow, like all over the place. Like they just like they're they're way out of the way. They're not going the direct route, and that that that's interesting, right? Why wouldn't you take the fastest route possible here? Instead, God takes them on a on a route that begins a forty year journey. This 40-year journey that required God to perform a, a bunch of miracles, including the parting of the Red Sea. See, we need to understand that Moses, Moses did not choose the route here because he was confused or lost. That's, that's not why they did this route or, or, or followed this route. We need to understand this, this that Moses did not act on his own that God was, he was following God, that God was leading Israel every step of the way. But why would God choose such a long route for the Israelites? And I think that's the question we need to ask ourselves as well. When we head into these seasons of our lives that we would classify as the wilderness, and you might have identified the, that, that season or area of your life, as we've gone through this series, but, but as we do that, and as we kind of close out here today, why does God sometimes have us go through these seasons in our life that are not a direct route to what we think he's leading us to? They're kind of these roundabout ways that lead us to all kinds of, 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 of odd and different directions that we thought we would head from, from what he told us to do. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some lessons along that journey. The, just, just a little bit further past the Red Sea, what are some lessons that we can gain from that journey that they took that, that ultimately I think a lot of times we take and lessons that we can learn from the journey through the wilderness as well? See, I think in our society, efficiency is key, Right? I mean, that, that's kind of what we're always trying to do. We're trying to find efficiencies in budget numbers. We're trying to find efficiencies in routes. We like to use a GPS. We want to get to the destination as quick as we possibly can. That's why people are speeding on the roads. That's why they're, they're, they're booking flights that don't have connections. I mean, all these kind of things, right? Efficient as possible. This is kind of how our society functions, what we think about. But there's reasons for... For, for taking routes like this. And there's reasons that God sometimes leads us into the wilderness or has us in the wilderness for a season. And, and the first thing we see here with the Israelites is this. The shortest route would have taken the Israelites through hostile Philistine country. Now, now we find out that later on, they do defeat, right? They, we, we, we do hear about this. And, and the Philistines, they, we hear about Goliath, right? We, we, we understand the story later on that takes place. But for right now, they would have had, if they were taking that shortest route, the, the, the week, maybe a little over a week route to get to the promised land, there would have been some problems. I mean, there, there would have been some major issues in hostility here. In fact, Exodus 13, 17 and 18 reads like this. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. See, the, the, these people, the Israelites, they had spent the last eight to ten generations in slavery in Egypt. They, they would have been slaves in Egypt. They, 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 were not, they were not an army. They were not ready for battle. They did not have weapons. They did not have the things to, to face off against any kind of opposition or armies. These were broken people who had been through a lot and who had been treated very harshly. And so while it might have looked great to only take a week and a couple days to get there, they would have been slaughtered. They, they, they would have been annihilated and, and, and they would have faced uh, such people as the Moabites and the Amalekites and other nations before actually getting to Canaan where they'd have to fight the Canaanites. And so they, they had tons of opposition had they taken that Right, route. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew tribes, they, they were in no condition to fight a battle. And, and, and here's, here's what we get out of that, is that sometimes when we head into, it might look like the, the fastest possible route, and, and I believe God is leading me here, and I want to get there as quick as possible. And, and sometimes God is just saying, hold up a second. You are in no condition to do this. 
Your, your heart is right. Yes, you might want to do this. Yes, I have this in your, in your plans. I have this story to tell in your life. Yes, I have something I've promised for you. But right now is not the season for that. Right now is not the time for that. And I know better than you. And it's exactly what takes place with the Israelites. And sometimes it's exactly what takes place for us, which leads us to point number two, lessons along the way. Number two, God wanted the Egyptians to know that he is Lord. The Egyptians. I mean, we know that God wanted the Israelites to know that he is Lord, but he also wanted the Egyptians to know that. You see, though God had this, this, this responsibility to bring the Jewish people to the promised land, to, 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 to show them and to give them the promised land, the land flowing of milk and honey, he also cared about the spiritual condition of the Egyptians. In fact, Exodus 14.4, it reads like this. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And sometimes when you are in the wilderness, you, you need to take the blinders off here. Sometimes it's not actually only about you. It's about other people. And, and, and God is, is, is showing the Egyptians that he is Lord. And sometimes through our story, God is showing others around us that he is Lord. That he is provider. That, that he is the one who sustains. He is the one who, 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 who tells the story ultimately. And, and so when you're, when you're focused on yourself or, or what you're going through or why this isn't working or why I'm sitting in this for so long, sometimes God is using that not only for you, but for other people because he, he, he loves everybody, right? Like he's, he, he's, he's, he cares about the spiritual condition of all of humanity, which leads us to point number three here. God planned to show his people his might one more time. He wasn't done. He, he had shown his might. I mean, the stories, the legends of, of Joseph. And then, and then we hear about Moses. And then we hear about, about the, the, the plagues. And now they're coming up to the Red Sea. And he, 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 he does a, performs a miracle in the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh's army. And it would be forever settled in their minds. That, that their Egyptian masters, they would never be capable again of dragging them back into slavery. God wanted to prove one more time that, that, that he was the one in control, that he was the deliverer. There was no person who was the deliverer. It was God himself. And only by him were they set free. And God sometimes brings us through these Red Sea experiences in our life to prove that he is, he's God. He is the deliverer. He is the one who sets us free. I love John 8, 32. It reads like this, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is, is that God is the ultimate rescuer. And, and, and he, he doesn't want us to look back. He, he doesn't want us to focus. He says, I am the one who delivered you from who you once were to who you are now. It's not based on anyone, and you have the freedom. You are no longer slaves to who you used to be. You are free. Which leads us to the fourth lesson. God wanted his children to know that there was no turning back. There's no turning back. You, you, you can't go back to the way you used to live. You can't go back to who you, you used to be. And the Red Sea, it's sealing off. It's not like the sea was going to open again and they changed their mind and they can go back through back to Egypt. It wasn't like that. It closed off. It sealed. It was done. They couldn't go back to where they came from. But, but sometimes when we, get, when we get in these patterns of life where things get difficult or, or we're wandering in the wilderness of our spiritual life or relationally or financially or whatever it is, we think back to those times. We, we overemphasize. We exaggerate how good it used to be. Oh, but I remember, oh yeah, that was so good or that, that thing worked out and we forget all the bad things. And we almost like fantasize the way it used to be. And really, it wasn't that good. In fact, they, they're doing the same thing. Numbers 11.5, they say this. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, also the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Oh my goodness, the garlic. 
But they have totally forgotten that they were treated so incredibly harshly that they were slaves, that they were in bondage, that this was not God's plan for their life, but they were hyper-focused on this because they couldn't see the future. They were in the dry place between bondage and the land of milk and honey, and the Israelites would just be tempted to grumble about this. And God says, you are not going back to this. You're not going back to this. I have so much more for you. Don't, don't, don't worry about this. Don't worry about your past. Continue to go forward. Continue to, to, to follow my lead to the places I want to take you. And sometimes it's like that with us. The Red Sea is described as like the first baptism. And going on, you're, you're, kinda, you're, you're not going to, to the past. You're, you're, you're resurrected. You're, you're made new. This is a new chapter of your life. And God says, I'm sealing this thing up from who you used to be. This is only new days and a hopeful future. And I have this plan for you. And I want you to follow along. And yes, it might not be tomorrow. It might not be a week from now. It could be way out in the future. But follow me through the wilderness until we get there. Don't focus on the past. Which leads us to lesson number five. God took the Israelites the long way because he had a great plan for them. He had plans to transform them, to to provide order and laws, to, to, to create a new nation. He gave them the Ten Commandments that he, he wrote with his own hands. He, he, he planned to create this, this new civil and spiritual society and giving them the Torah, the first five books of, of the Bible, of the Old Testament here. That he, and and he, would, he would do all this. He would create freedom and, and bountiful, bounty and he provided money and finances and gold and jewelry. He provides all this for the future, he took them the long way because he needed to get them ready for what they were about to settle and experience. He knew this was far beyond their capacity right now. And he provided all these different pieces of the puzzle so that when it came time, they could lay the puzzle all out and they could complete it. And he could say, I provided all this for you. I I am the one to be to to blame here. I'm the one who did it all for you. But there was a rhyme and reason that you took the long way rather than that short. We wouldn't have got the Ten Commandments. We wouldn't have got all the other things that they needed in order to settle in the promised land. Which leads to number six. God wanted to demonstrate to the Israelites that he could sustain them even in the wilderness. That when worse comes to worse, and it doesn't look like there's, there's, there's anything else, it looks like it's the end of the line that God will still provide. He miraculously su- uh, supplied um, a, a huge nation. Now we're talking two million people with water from a rock. He provides manna, the, the what is it, as we recalled, right, from heaven. He provides meat in the form of flocks of birds, And he wants them to radically rely on him in desperate times and in desperate measures that he will come through. It's not a trap he's setting for them. It's to show that he is the provider, that he is the sustainer, and that in the wilderness, he will see them through. He has not forgotten them. Which leads us to the final lesson here. God wanted a people who would trust in his leading. He wanted a people who would trust in his leading. See, the Bible tells us that the Hebrew people that God had supernaturally delivered and sustained, some of them, some of them just like made fun of the future. So some of them complained along the way. And, and he, wanted, he wanted the people who would fully rely on him. So in a sense, they were getting weeded out. He, he, he wanted the people who were really in this, who were really longing for what was next, for, for, for the deliverer, for the provider. He, he, wanted, he wanted those people. In fact, Numbers 13.30, as people proclaimed and grumbled, and it says, we should go up and take possession of the land, for, for we can certainly do it. I mean, I'm sick of being in the wilderness. I'm just going to go solve this myself. I, I, I can't handle this anymore. It seems like we're just wandering. It doesn't make any sense or rhyme or reason. I'm just going to go ahead and do this myself. 
Others complained that the land was filled with Nephilim, the fathers of the Anakim. The Nephilim, these, these giants that we're never going to be able to go in there. We're never going to settle this. We're never going to go to the land of milk and honey because we're going to have to face the Nephilim. We see this in Numbers 13.33. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. We're never going to get out of this situation. We're never going to reach the destination that God would have us go. And because of that, many of the people who, who left Egypt, they didn't see the promised land. It's the next generation. Who, who, who realized, who, who needed to depend on God, who, who really understood what it meant to rely and depend and prepare for what was next. See, just as the Israelites crossed the sea in order to get out of Egypt, they later crossed another river. Another river to get into the promised land. Both of these rivers are huge barriers, and I don't know what the barrier is you're facing. And I don't know what he, he, he has for you in your future, but I do know that he, he does have a future. He has a story to tell, and even when you seem like he is far away or you are struggling in the wilderness, you are struggling to find your way, the encouragement God has for you today is don't look back. Keep following, keep going forward. Maybe he's trying to teach you or, or explain or help you to rely and have a deeper dependency on him. But you, you are made new. You, you have a new story that he is writing in your life. And he has a destination for you. And so let's look at the next steps here from today's teaching. First one is this. Don't look back to who you used to be. Don't, don't fantasize about how it was, what you used to have, the, the situation that you used to be in. Focus on where God is leading, where God has you now, and be content where he has you now, but also ha ha have an urgency or, or a longing to go to where God would have you go. Understanding that he will be, he is Yahweh, and he wants to provide for you, even in the midst of going through difficult wilderness situations. Number two is this. Look forward to the next breakthrough. If he's done it once, he can do it again. God leads us into a deeper relationship with him. And maybe for you, that breakthrough is, is letting go of who you used to be. Maybe, maybe for you, the breakthrough is, 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 is kind of cutting the chains of bondage that were holding you back. You were a slave to something. Maybe the next breakthrough is experiencing freedom. Maybe the next breakthrough is, is fully relying and trusting on God in some area of your life or total dependency on God or, or stepping into the waters of baptism. What is the next breakthrough? And, and look forward to that, where God is leading you as you pursue holy holiness as you grow, grow closer in your relationship with him. And then number three, believe that God has a future for you. That he has a future, that he, he has set you apart, that he is, he is telling a story, and that he has a future for him. And cling to that in the midst of the unknown of the wilderness. Let's pray. Father, we... Uh, as we think about the Red Sea, as we think about the, the parting of the waters and, and walking through and just an absolute miracle that that would have, would have been and to experiencing that, God, we, we just know that that was just kind of the beginning of this next chapter as the Israelites are, are, are understanding and learning why sometimes you lead them through the long way, God. And, and as we go through our life's journey, God, I don't know who is, is, is joining us here today who needs to hear that, Father. Maybe, maybe they're, they're, they're frustrated about where they are. Maybe they're impatient about where they are. Maybe, maybe they're, they're, they're thinking about how it used to be, God. I, I just pray that you would, you, you would give them strength, Father, that they would understand that you are the provider, that you are the creator, that you would carry them through, and God, that you would lead them, and, and they would fully rely on you, that they would see your provision, your pursuit, your love, and your leading. And so, God, we ask for your blessing as we take these next steps here today. In Jesus' name, amen.